I don't know if I have anything to draw this on. I feel like drawing would help a lot. We have the security breach pizza plex. Ladies, gentlemen, and those with the good sense to do away with the whole notion, I welcome you to the premier audio medium for all your Fazbear entertainment needs. The Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. Note, FFPP is not responsible for any loss of appetite, disinterest, dismemberment, or other legally classified statuses. So strap in and enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. I'm your host with the toast, Rytos, here for another episode of FNAF. And this is a special episode. We have officially hit 30 episodes in uh, the podcast. I mean, that's more than half of a year. That's a good round number. Um, I'm surprised it's still going on so long, and I'm surprised y'all are still watching it. Um, the podcast needed a little maintenance. I know some of you have noticed that I've been forgetting to upload to Spotify, and by proxy, if I don't upload to Spotify, it doesn't upload anywhere outside of YouTube. So if you're listening on Amazon or iTunes, I apologize, especially to, I apologize to Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, wherever else you listen, if it's not YouTube, um, that should be resolved as of this episode. Um, that being said, not only am I doing a little maintenance on that end, I have a big backlog of questions that I just have not had time for because, you know, some episodes I didn't have time for questions because we had a guest on or some questions took longer than expected or things like that. So for today's podcast episode, I wanted to focus in and just answer y'all's questions. So these have been pulled from Spotify, from the email, anywhere I can get them. I've pulled them. I've got a huge list. We might not get to all of them, but we're going to get to as many as we can. Um, and if you want your questions answered on the podcast in the future, go ahead and send them to Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast at gmail.com. That is in the description, so you can copy and paste it because it's a paid to type. Or if you're on Spotify, you can also enter it directly on Spotify. Um, so without any further ado, let's get going. Um, our first question comes from Charlie Any All. What are your thoughts on if FNAF World is an arcade machine? Also the idea of UCN being inside of Tangle. For a bit of extra thought, the Burn Trap boss fight room in base security breach has a similar layout to the UCN office. Thank you for your question, Charlie. It's an interesting thought. So a few things. One, I don't think FNAF World is in an arcade machine. After reading Fazbear Frights, I'm pretty convinced that FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night to an extent are a spirit going through and modifying the memories of people to do something, right? For FNAF World, it's, I believe, Charlie amplifying the positive memories of all of the people post FNAF 6 and trying to allow them to find peace, whether or not they're able to move on, right? Just allowing them to find peace in where they are. Um, and I, I think that's pretty solid. And I think the same logic goes for Ultimate Custom Night, where in the Fazbear Frights books, we get a pretty clear example of what is most likely Ultimate Custom Night, where uh, in, the, in the books, Andrew is inside the mind of William Afton, keeping him alive as long as he can, specifically to torture him. And he's literally, like, present in his mind. So whether or not Andrew or those books are within the game's timeline, I think the idea that Ultimate Custom Night is the vengeful spirit amplifying the worst memories William has to keep him forever tormented in his own mind, I think that makes a lot of sense. I realized I was too far back, so I was a little green. So, but to your question... If FNAF World is in an arcade machine, I don't think it is. Not important for this. What about the idea of Ultimate Custom Night being inside of the Tangle? I do like that idea, right? Because as far as we're aware, a weird part of the man in room 1280 is that William Afton is in a hospital bed. And if this is after the FNAF 6 fire, where the fuck did they find him? He should be un he should be in the rubble of everything else in FNAF 6, hidden away from the public. I don't know why he would be in a hospital. But if we're talking about the game's timeline here, and FNAF 6 is there and gets bulldozed over and they put a the pizza plex on top of it, right? Like FNAF 6 sinks into the ground and they build on top of it. If they do it that way, then William Afton is kind of stuck in the FNAF 6 fire in perpetuity until we break into the restaurant and find what's going on. So then here's the question, right? Is William still in Ultimate Custom Night? And if so, is that within the tangle? I'm not sure. So it depends on where you believe William ends up. 
Because there is Burn Trap, we have to acknowledge, which has flesh on him, right? So is Burn Trap the charred remains of Scrap Trap, or is Burn Trap something else? If Burn Trap is something else, then William Afton's corpse is most likely within the Tangle already. And if William Afton's corpse is in the Tangle, it's very possible William Afton is quote-unquote still alive, still being tortured by the Vengeful Spirit in Ultimate Custom Night. That makes a lot of sense. And then it also explains why so many animatronics are still there. Where it's the matter of like, the Vengeful Spirit is pulling on the agony of all of the other animatronics to boost, to boost and bolster the mental prison that they are creating for William Afton and pulling from those memories still attached to those animatronics and shoving them into this nightmare he's created. I think that makes a lot of sense for the Tangle and Ultimate Custom Night. My one problem with it is William Afton being inside of it. Because as of right now, I do believe Burn Trap is mostly the remains of Scrap Trap. I don't think entirely. I think repairs have been done to him post FNAF 6, especially after Vanny and Freddy get down there. So, okay, how do I square this away? Well, I think what we see in the Burn Trap ending, whether or not the Burn Trap ending being canon, if it's not canon, it didn't happen. But if the Burn Trap ending happens, what I think we're seeing is the Tangle putting William back into Ultimate Custom Night. Right. So we see in. I think it makes a lot of sense. Here's the the like mini timeline for you. Right. If and I really like this idea, I hadn't considered this. I really like your idea of the tangle being the physical embodiment of Ultimate Custom Night and what is going on outside of the mental prison that is Ultimate Custom Night. So. FNAF 6 fire happens and in that big, massive conglomerate of burnt metal and charred animatronics and agony the vengeful spirit sucks all of it up and uses it to forever torture william afton until the rest of time that's that's the vengeful, vengeful spirit's goal i'm going to make william the rest of eternity terrible for william afton and this goes on for years until glitch trap gets vanny and uh t blah, blah, blah. until glitch trap gets vanny and commands her to go get William Afton. And it's at this point that Vanny and Glamrock Freddy dig up FNAF 6, and they find that big mess of agony and animatronics, and Vanny pulls out the body of William Afton, now, m like, materially fused to the old Spring Bonnie suit. Once Vanny pulls him out of there, the Vengeful Spirit's connection to William severs. And it's like, okay, I wasn't in your mind yet. I, I I was messing with your mind. I wasn't a part of you yet. So now I can't continue Ultimate Custom Night. What do I do about this? William Afton is then put into the um, charging pod and Vanny begins doing experiments and repairs to this body in the hopes of, okay, we have Burn Trap. If we can put Glitch Trap inside of a fixed Burn Trap, we can essentially bring back William Afton. And that plan begins. So then you have the burn trap ending, where if Gregory and Freddy, while they're at the security breach pizzaplex, get down to that lair and destroy that lair and take down William Afton in the process, the moment William Afton is f like moving around again, the Tangle goes after him, grabs him, and brings it with him. And the Tangle's first goal, I'm putting William Afton right back inside, and his ass is going right back into the nightmare prison. And Ultimate Custom Night continues from then on. I think that makes a lot of sense. The question is, did that happen? Because is the Burn Trap ending canon? Maybe not. It might not be. Now, here's another possibility I haven't considered until this moment. We've mentioned in Ruin, we don't see Burn Trap, we don't see Vanny, we only see the Mimic, and we hear Gregory via walkie-talkie. We also see the Tangle escaping as we get there. What if the Burn Trap ending hasn't happened? And Vanny and Burn Trap have already left. What if her experiment was completed? Hell, we barely see Glitch Trap in the in Ruin, right? Like, sure. 
is glitch trap helpy most likely maybe but the mimic seems to be pulling a lot of the strings to get Cassie down there. And the Mimic and Glitchtrap have a very interesting relationship. Are they the same thing? Are they two halves of one coin? Sure, sure. But there is a possibility that whichever ending happened in Security Breach, by the time of Ruin, Vanny has finished the Burn Trap experiments and repairs and her and William Afton, knowing that this area is pretty compromised, leave. Because when we get to Ruin, the charging pod that William is in is empty. That where Burn Trap is supposed to be, nothing is in there. And a lot of people took that as confirmation that Burn Trap never existed. I take the endings of Security Breach as possibilities. I don't think that they're all canon, but I think because of the nature that they are endings of Security Breach... They are all possible in the timeline. One of them happened, but all of those are things that could have happened. Those are other what ifs, which means Burn Trap does exist. And if Gregory went down there, that could have happened. Does that mean it's canon? I don't think so. What I think makes a lot of sense with an empty Burn Trap pod thinking about this right now and also to continue the legacy of William Afton and continue the storyline of these games Burn Trap has been repaired him and Vanny have left that's why the pot is empty they're done they finished now they're off to somewhere more secure since this place is crumbling around them that's why the tangle leaves at the beginning of ruin the Tangle wants to put William back in itself and put it back into Ultimate Custom Night where it can keep him forever alive and forever tortured. But right now, William Afton is no longer in the building, so the Tangle is following suit. I think that does make a lot of sense, and I thank you, Charlie, for your question. I hadn't considered Ultimate Custom Night being what the Tangle is trying to do, and that does make a lot of sense. So I wonder if that's how this is going. I'm going to have to write that down because I think that's going to be part of the timeline. That makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, there's the question, well, then what about Help Wanted 2 and Vanny and, like, how she crushes Glitchtrap in one of the endings? I'd have to think more about that because then there is also the answer of, like, if they repair William Afton enough, right, and it and Vanny finds out that due to Remnant or Agony, Burn Trap already has the personality and memories of William Afton, does she need glitch trap anymore? Or like I thought originally when glitch trap takes over is trying to take over Cassie's dad, who I believe is the protagonist of help wanted Two, that could be Vanny's jealousy of it's she's not destroying glitch trap. She's destroying the piece of glitch trap that replicated within Jeremy's mind. Cassie's dad, who I believe is named Jeremy. Um, so it's not, I'm destroying glitch trap. It's, I'm Glitchtrap's favorite. You aren't. This piece of Glitchtrap that's been replicated into you? Fake. Not real. The one in me is the real one. That makes a lot of sense, too. Kind of the idea of a devout follower being so devout and faithful and obsessed with who they're following, they end up ultimately being a detriment to them. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um... But anyway, I hope that answers your question, Charlie. I kind of went off, but that's uh, going to be a recurring theme with these questions. I have like 15 questions pulled up and one took 10 minutes. Oops, we'll go we'll go a little bit faster. Um, our next question comes, some of these questions are pretty quick. Um, our next question comes from Lost He Him. Thank you for your question. You and other creators have included FNAF World in your theories and timeline, but I thought Scott Loki disowned that game a while ago. I may have missed something along these many years. Thank you for question lost. Yeah, so FNAF World is an interesting thing. Some folks take it as non-canon. The only, as far as I'm aware, the only direct statement ever made by Scott is that he regrets making FNAF World canon. So to me, that's pretty conclusive of like, man, I wish I didn't do that, which means he did do that. So as far as we're aware, FNAF World is canon. And there are some folks that think FNAF World is like, one of the I know FNAF World and UCN are often debated to be the only Scott made games that are not 
the indie developer games, which I think makes a lot of sense. So Help World introduced er, Help World Help Wanted introduced the idea of an indie game developer making FNAF games to discredit um, the actual events that happened during the Fazbear Restaurant era, right? And Help Wanted the story tells us that that's one, two, three, and parts of four. Help Wanted the game implies it's one, two, three, four, sister location, and six. Those are all the direct references that we can get from Help Wanted to one of the games. And then it doubles down because in Security Breach, you have things like the Ennard cutout that you can put your face in and Dr. Scraptrap's Mad Science Lab or whatever. So like, if these are like fr merchandisable characters, then that does imply that Sister Location and Pizzeria Simulator are in-universe games. Because I mean, like, by all accounts, sure, Circus Baby, she was a public figure. People know about her. Ennard? If Sister Location does not exist as a video game in the FNAF world, Ennard does not exist as a character. That is something that literally only Michael saw. It killed Michael and then left Michael for dead when the body stopped working and split off into two things. So Ennard was only seen by Michael. So if Ennard is a merchandisable character, that has to mean Sister Location is a like a video game in this universe. As does Shadow Bonnie, which is also in that same graveyard of cutouts, which is a crazy revelation, which then goes back to FNAF 2. And then for Pizzeria Simulator, not only do you have the Scrap Plush Babies, which we see in Help Wanted, which is a design off of Scrap Baby, who should have only been seen by Henry and Michael, but if you want to take it a step further in Tales from the Pizzaplex, the Pizzeria Simulator game is directly referenced as a game. So like, that's pretty good evidence that it's an in-universe game. And I know a lot of people brush at the idea of those games being in-universe games. It's like, okay, well then is it all meaningless? Or, okay, so like the coolest moment in the franchise, Henry's speech, is that not real? I don't think so. I don't think that's what that means. And another question goes into this. So I'll save my whole, I guess we'll, we'll just pull the question now. Um, let's combine a couple questions. So we're still working on Lost's question. I'm also bringing in Harriet's question. She, her, thank you for your question. You said many times before you think the implications of the original FNAF games being in-universe indie games is that information in the newer games supersedes information in the older games when the two conflict. But I think an interesting question is when this actually happened. What information and events in new games have retconned the old games, if any? Thank you for your question, Harriet. So yes... I think that the help wanted that help wanted introducing that the Scott made games are indie games is their way of saying, look, we want to continue this story. But like half of these games were made eight years ago by a guy flying by the seat of his pants. So if we want to make a compelling story, we might have to tweak some things. So if something we say in these new games somewhat contradicts something in the older games, believe the new games first. I think that makes the most sense for the attitude going into Help Wanted. Not to say that everything in those old games is incorrect. Use that as your basis, but if we need to tweak one or two things, trust the things we tweak. I guess that answers your question lost of FNAF World has not been disowned, and in fact, FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night might be the only old Scott-made FNAF games still in the current timeline as not in-universe games. So, it's actually a very important game. Um, that being said, to Harriet's question, what information events the new games have retconned, if any? I don't think there's been much. And there definitely hasn't been anything that, like, confirmed to have been, like, changed in the newer games. I do think some things have been adjusted. One of the examples being the designs of certain characters. Specifically, Molten Freddy. Molten Freddy was always weird because it's just the Funtime Freddy mask, but, like, burnt and orange now? So it feels like a whole new mask. And I like the idea of like uh, Molten Freddy trying to make a face and just taking bits of scrap that kind of look like Freddy's face and making it Freddy's face. That's cool. I like that. But if that's in the Pizzeria Simulator game, ostensibly there is no way the indie game developer would have actually known what Molten Freddy looks like. It would have been his best guess. And then in Security Breach, where Molten Freddy was last spotted, there's a giant blob of wires and animatronics led by a Freddy mask. 
I don't think it's a stretch to say that that is the new form of Molten Freddy that has grown stronger and larger. So, that being said, it's led by a Funtime Freddy mask. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think Molten Freddy might have always actually had that Funtime Freddy mask. And that's just an inaccuracy. So, I think that's a perfect example of what I mean by the newer games tweaking details about the older games. Funtime Freddy being the head of Molten Freddy makes a lot of sense. And if that's true, then that means Pizzeria Simulator was inaccurate in that way. But trust the new game on that. So I think it comes down to things like that. But uh, Harriet, thank you for your question. Next question comes from Alder Purple, any all. Actually, two questions from Alder Purple because I like them both a lot. Our first question is, if Gigi Y and Vanny trapped the Mimic instead of Gregory and Vanessa, then why does his backpack say Gregory and not Gigi Y? Great question. Um, this is going to be a quick one because it's kind of a minor detail. It's a minutia. Gigi Y is specifically the name that the possessed Gregory used on arcade machines. We don't know, and I don't think there's any evidence that Gregory ever called himself GGY. It's just a very easy, concise, and understandable nickname that's been given to him by the community because of what he used in the arcades. If anything, the only nickname he ever goes by that we're aware of is Rab, short for Dr. Rabbit. Um, and Dr. Rabbit feels really weird. So Rab, I guess works. Vanny and Rabbit, I guess that works. But a lot of people have been calling him GGY because it's close to Gregory. So it's easier for people to go, oh, I know who that's supposed to be talking about. So that being said, as GGY or as Dr. Rabbit, he was still pretending to be a normal child named Greg. So the idea that his backpack would be labeled Gregory makes a lot of sense. In fact, if his backpack was labeled Dr. Rabbit or GGY, that'd be crazy. So I, I think it makes a lot more sense that it is labeled as Gregory. And that being said, the backpack being evidence that GGY and Vanny locked the mimic in there, I still think holds true. Um, and your other question, this was one that I thought was very fun. What is the one theory with very little or no evidence that you would protect at all costs? Um, I really like the idea that after sister location michael afton is looking for william afton while trying to help the crying child move on with the help of cassidy there's very little evidence of this the main evidence being the security logbook where it seems like cassidy which we do get the name of with this word search and what seems to be the crying child, which we have much less evidence for, are having a conversation that Michael is witnessing in this security logbook. Security logbook that spans from FNAF 1 to FNAF 3. At, at least takes place after FNAF 3, because that's the office that we see in there. And it would make sense for Fazbear Frights, the attraction, to have some kind of booklet like this as merchandise. Not to mention, by the time of FNAF 3, Michael Afton has been scooped which means he was attacked with a remnant injector. When Carlton in the books was attacked with remnant, he was then not only healed, even though he should have died, he was able to speak to spirits while in that weird ethereal state. So I think the idea that after being attacked with the scooper, Michael is able to be healed by the remnant left inside him and is more attuned to the spirits around him makes a lot of sense. And it makes for a really compelling character arc for Michael Afton, where it's like Michael Afton, the guy who ostensibly killed his younger brother, is now spending his later years atoning for that by trying to get revenge for him and trying to help him move on. I think that's a really compelling character arc. The problem is there's basically very, very, very little evidence for this theory. The only evidence being that the security logbook Mike uses has those conversations. And is that book even canon to the games? I don't know. You know, and the scooper doing that to Michael, that's using a, in the books, Carlton gets injected with a syringe full of remnant. In the games, Michael gets attacked with a scooper that says trace amounts of remnant will be left on the injector. So like, it's not one and the same at all. It's speculation based off of loose connections. But what in FNAF isn't? So I think it makes for such a compelling narrative that I'm willing to make more of an, an assumption with less evidence there. That's my opinion on that. So that, that would be the theory that no matter, like, even though there's almost no evidence for it, I'm willing to go to bat and protect that theory. Thank you for your questions, Older Puddle. This would be a good question to get the layout stuff. 
This question comes from rules. He, him. Thank you for your question. It's very down the rabbit hole, but basically, if the FNAF 6 pizzeria is the same as Fred Bear's pizzeria, or Fred Bear's family diner, that would make Fred Bear's underneath the Pizzaplex. Not only would that make the Pizzaplex extremely close to the FNAF house, and if the sister location bunker is under the FNAF 4 house, that would make everything connected because the Pizzaplex is massive and it would probably cover it all. I'm probably overthinking it, but it's just fun to think about. You're not overthinking it, rules. I let's let's go through a walk down architecture, and we'll we'll go only via evidence, and then we'll draw the conclusion. So we have evidence because of the fuse maps in the sister location bunker that si the sister location bunker is at least electronically connected to the chambers that do the FNAF 4 testing, the actual FNAF 4 house and Fred Bear's Family Diner. Those are all separate connections that we can see within the sister location map. Also, we can see the fun with Plus Trap minigame. So like we see all of these are connected to the sister location bunker electronically. Does that mean they're nearby? Not necessarily, but it is likely, right? Like why would he run a power cable 15, 20 miles away just to control the fuse of Fred Bear's Family Diner when he could control the fuse in Fred Bear's Family Diner. So I think it does make a lot of sense that these things would be nearby. Not to mention, Michael Afton spends his evenings in the FNAF 4 house and his, like, working hours in Sister Location. So that's at least a one-to-one, -one, that the Sister Location bunker is very close to the FNAF 4 house. So then we look at architecture. Where is Fred Bear's in compared to the FNAF 4 house? I still very much believe that the Junior's building in Midnight Motorist is the aftermath of Fred Bear's closing down. I think it makes a lot of sense that Fred Bear's was open near the FNAF 4 house, and when it closed down, it was bought up by Junior's and turned into something, a bar or something, I don't know. You know, that being kind of like an insult to injury to William Afton, and being further motivation for him to be, like, going crazy and being, like, angry at Henry or whatever. So, if that's true, then the FNAF 4 house that we see in Midnight Motorist is very close to Fred Bear's. And that's backed up by the FNAF 4 daytime minigames, where the crying child can walk from the FNAF 4 house to Fred Bear's. Like, they're literally a couple blocks away. And it looks somewhat similar in Midnight Motorist, where it's that same C shape. You just go down the street and go up there and you're there. So then the big question comes... If Junior's, or the f old Fred Bear's location, is where FNAF 6 is opened up, which I also think makes a lot of sense, and then we know for a fact that the Pizzaplex was built on top of the FNAF 6 pizzeria, what is the layout here? And not to mention, in Ruin, we go through underground tunnels that take us from FNAF 6 to what looks like a scooper, which could be an updated and modified scooper from Sister Location, especially since there's an elevator and everything. So, like, the idea I think that I have of the layout of all of this is literally, let's go ground down. The Pizzaplex... The FNAF 4 house. Oh, and one more thing. We know for a fact the Pizzaplex is built in the middle of fucking nowhere because in the Help Wanted Curse of Dreadbear DLC, when you go to get stuffed by Glitchtrap, you can instead escape and you go outside and you see them building the Pizzaplex in the middle of the woods, which is where we see Midnight Motors taking place. So we have the Pizzaplex and then some distance away, the FNAF 4 house. Go down one layer and we have the FNAF 6 Pizzeria. Go down another layer, and we have the Sister Location Bunker. I think that's legitimately what we're looking at here. That it's kind of like... I don't know if I have anything to draw this on. I feel like drawing would help a lot. We have the Security Breach, Pizzaplex, and the FNAF 4 House. Under the FNAF 4 House, Sister Location. Under the Pizzaplex, FNAF 6, Tunnel Connecting Them. And then... Further, off to the left, off to the side of sister location would be the FNAF 4 testing chambers. I think that's legitimately the layout we're looking at here. And it's crazy, but like that's what we've been presented. So that, that that's my thoughts on that. So thank you for your question, Rules. 
Our next question comes from Rin, they, them, thank you for your question. In both the books, specifically the Silver Eyes trilogy and the movie, William is seen somewhat controlling the animatronics after they are possessed. Do you think there's a possibility that the game William also did the same or similar thing? If so, how do you think this would change things or would it really not change much? That's an interesting thought because you're right. I never really put that together. In the books and in the movie, William is controlling the animatronics. That's the whole point of them. Now, in the first Silvaris books, it's like a loose connection. And then in like the fourth closet, he's directly commanding the Funtime animatronics. It's really interesting to, th and then in the movie, obviously he has like, he's like, go get them, go get them. I'm their friend that listen to me. In the games, we never really see that. In the games, as far as we're aware, it seems like William is learning about this in real time. Now in the Silver Eyes, William gets a lot more invested about like being able to control them with Remnant after he's been killed a couple times. So I wonder if all of this is kind of prepping us for the new direction of Five Nights at Freddy's. Where before it was surviving against these kind of like animalistic animatronics who are attacking everything nearby. And maybe in a future game, if what I said before is true and Burn Trap and Vanny left, doing more remnant experiments, the next time we face off against them, they are directly controlling the animatronics. Because, to be fair, in Security Breach, Glitchtrap is... In Security Breach, Glitchtrap is controlling the animatronics, but as far as like FNAF 1 through 6, I don't know if there's a time where we are facing off animatronics directly controlled by William Afton. I don't know if that's happening. Whereas, in Security Breach, it's controlled by Glitchtrap, maybe in the next game, it will be remnant-possessed animatronics directly under the control of William Afton. And you either have to defeat him, or maybe there's a secret ending where you help those spirits move on and realize William is the bad guy and have them turn on William. That would be awesome. That would make for a great game. I think that might be the direction they go into, but as far as like the control we see in the books and the movie, I don't know if we've seen that yet. I don't know. I don't think we have. Thank you for your question. That's a great point I've never really thought about. Our next question comes from Sakura, she, her. Um, this is either going to be fast or take a long time depending on how much of a rant I go on. I was wondering about the coded wall found in Security Breach, Secret Room. The um the one from Security Breach proper in the sister location, like Michael FNAF 4 house room, where we get the therapy CDs, like the triangle code. More specifically, I want to know who wrote it and how they're able to predict the events of the game slash instruct the reader. Was it Michael, Vanessa, Glitchtrap, Henry, or Cassie's dad? If we are to presume they are for Gregory, then how are they of use if it's something accessible at the end of the game? <coughs> it's really interesting, Sakura. That's a great question. That code is something I've kind of taken advantage of not really thinking about that much because it is a weird sticking point of like, well... Who wrote it? And why is it instructions on how to beat the glam rocks? So let's go down the list because you give a good list here. Did Michael write that? Did Michael write that code? I don't think so. I have not seen any evidence to convince me that Michael Afton's spirit still remains. I think Michael Afton has moved on. I hope so. Um, so I do not think Michael Afton wrote that code because I think I do think whoever wrote that code must have had to have written it like just before the like before the events of security breach after the pizza box was built i don't think it's like it was carried over or anything like that um and to that point i also don't think henry wrote that code because i also think henry's dead and gone i think henry and michael afton have moved on so then did vanessa write it one of the earliest earliest theories i made on this channel is that that poem is Vanessa and Vanny having an argument. And I really do like that theory because depending on where you put punctuation and notably there's no punctuation in the poem. So depending on where you put the punctuation, you can divvy it up into a conversation every other line. So that's really interesting. But do I think it's likely? I don't know. I do like that theory. I don't know if it's the most likely option though um i don't think glitchtrap wrote it glitchtrap writing it doesn't make a lot of sense to me what i think is interesting is it is the story 
the storyteller. Um, when let me get the actual quote here. Okay. I took so long to get these references that I don't remember the exact train of thought I was on. So if I a little off of what I was just talking about, that's why I had to go pull up some references. But when we think about the code itself, it's made up of those weird triangle symbols. We have two instances where the mimic is connected to weird symbols that kind of uh, they're, they're described in a different ways. So in the mimic story, when the mimic and David are drawing, they would often write in symbols. So to quote, drawings that were surrounded by markings that looked vaguely like hieroglyphics. When Edwin asked David what they were, David had shrugged. It had been made up, but it riveted da David and mimic. So now David pulled out more paper and he and the mimic began scribbling more drawings and symbols. And then in the storyteller, which at this point, the storyteller is controlled by the mimic, as far as we're aware, when Edwin is locked in the storyteller and Mr. Burroughs goes to check on him like a day or two later, Mr. Bur uh, Edwin's already dead, but the inside of the tree is now filled with large sheets of construction paper with stick drawings and strange symbols that weren't familiar to Mr. Burroughs. Squiggles, squares, loops, triangles within triangles, mathematical equations, nonsensical ones, um, and they're all tangled up in the symbols. All written on top of this is, I'm sorry. So, twice in these books, it's connected that the mimic is drawing, like, these weird symbols. So, then it comes in, like, okay, there is the weird code symbol on this wall that is definitely, like, it's weird. It's one of those rooms where there's a lot of rooms in Security Breach that are recreations of other things, right? We have the Help Wanted rooms where there are rooms that look, I like, not identical, but very, very similar to rooms that we see in Help Wanted. Did I say Help Wanted twice? There's rooms in the Security Breach Pizzaplex that look very, very similar to rooms in Help Wanted, or at least, like, it looks like someone is trying to recreate rooms from Help Wanted, or it looks like there's someone trying to recreate rooms from Help Wanted in the Security Breach Pizzaplex. And that, to me, screams Mimic. That sounds like exactly something the Mimic would do. It's like, okay, I know these things. Let me recreate them in Security Breach. But the Mimic is trapped in the basement for almost all of it. So then, okay, is Glitchtrap making Vanny do this? Possibly. Because, ostensibly, I believe part of Glitchtrap is the programming for Mimic, the Mimic 1 program. So the idea that the Mimic 1 program is causing Vanny to recreate things from Help Wanted does make a lot of sense to me. And that would explain why certain rooms in Security Breach look very similar to the Help Wanted rooms they're meant to look like. Then we get to this, the, um, like the sister location Michael room, which looks so much like the living room from the FNAF 4 house. Okay, Maybe Glitchtrap made Vanny make that. Then it would make sense that Vanny would have wrote, written that code, but for Glitchtrap. But then pause. Why the hell would Glitchtrap be giving instructions on defeating the Glamrocks? That doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't add up. So then it throws a whole wrench into this. Like, okay, well then why is this happening? Well, you mentioned Cassie's dad. And Cassie's dad... I'm I I believe is Jeremy Fitzgerald, the FNAF 2 bite victim. Also the Bonnie bully. Also, ID's fantasy convinced me. I think it's also the Jeremy from Help Wanted. I think this poor guy just keeps getting damaged to his his head. He got bit in 87. He got uh like razor bladed at his last job, but he still he's gotta figure out what's going on with Fazbear. But if he was partially controlled by Glitchtrap and Help Wanted, maybe he's unconsciously recreating these rooms, right? We know he's an employee at this at the Security Breach Pizzaplex. He is an employee, at least as of Help Wanted 2, which seems to take place after Security Breach. So he possibly was an employee from before onward. As he's working there, he keeps recreating these rooms from Help Wanted, whether consciously or not. Maybe he is the one who builds the sister location room. After all, in my theory, Jeremy Fitzgerald was a close friend of Michael Afton way back when, so he would have seen that living room. 
Maybe he wrote the code. The code that he writes in this weird triangle code that, I don't know, either he creates it so the mimic that's already going into his head cannot see it, or that's all he can write in after a while. And Cassie's dad giving instructions on how to destroy the Glamrocks does make sense. Because at that point, they're taken over by Glitchtrap. And if Cassie's dad starts figuring out what's going on at the Pizzaplex, he would want other people to help to try to take this down in case he fails. So maybe he's the one who writes it. I don't know. Maybe that sounded like a huge ramble. I don't know. It's a big question. But I think Cassie's dad writing that code and building these rooms does make sense if he is Jeremy Fitzgerald and also help wanted Jeremy. And also Bonnie Bully. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Maybe you don't, but I like that idea. But I hope that answers your question, Sakura. Um, and it's weird. The recording is at 50 minutes, but I know I spent like five to 10 minutes looking up where those quotes were. So hopefully this is like a, a decent length. I don't know how long this episode is going to be, but I hope it's long enough because I'm officially out of questions. We hit all of them. So thank you again. If you want your questions handled on the podcast, send them to Podcast at gmail.com or on Spotify. Hopefully they're all uploaded by now. Again, apologies for that. But thank you for watching the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast where the pizza abilities are endless. We hope to enjoy your future patronage. Bye-bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>